Uh, if you can turn in your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes, if you don't know where that is, turn to the middle, you should be near Psalms or Proverbs, and turn right, and you'll be in Ecclesiastes. So that's where you turn to follow along. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, if you don't have an electronic device or something, we, can, we have spare Bibles on the back table there. So if you want one, you can either raise your hand and we'll bring one to you, or you can swat the fly that's bothering me. Okay. <laughs> Noah said, people say if, if God had, Noah had been truly wise, he would have squished those last two flies, but <laughs> we still got them. Same thing with mosquitoes and yellow jackets. Mm -hmm. Murder, hornets. Murder hornets. Yeah, those things are nice to not be around in the wintertime, right? What's that? Jalapeno. Jalapeno. We call that flies, sky raisins for our dogs to bite. And then the, the yellow jackets are jalapeno sky raisins, so they have a little more of a bite to them. But anyway... If you got one of those loaner Bibles, it will be on page 766 because it's the same edition that I've got. Otherwise, as they say, you're on, your results may vary. You'll be on your own. Now, there's a pastor who has a quote, and I found it, and I copied it and pasted it in here, and then I went back to find his name, and I, I searched for literally half an hour trying to find this guy's name. So he's, for some reason, God wanted his name unknown, but I'm telling you that I didn't write this, but I love it. Solomon pondered the idea of time. Every day we're given 24 hours, or 1,400 minutes, or 86,400 seconds. I did not do the math on that, by the way. Regardless of who we are, we all have the same amount of time. Ben Franklin once said, time, that's the stuff life is made of. Now, how do you perceive time? Well, 30 minutes for a student waiting the closing bell is different from that of a convicted murderer on death row who will, in 30 minutes, receive a lethal injection. One year for a teenager longing for a driver's license differs from the person who's just been told that they have one year to live because of a terminal illness. As it has been said, time either drags on or time flies, but time never stops. So, so often we're at work when we're at work, especially when we know we have to be there. Time drags on, but we still go. Now, a lot of people hate their jobs. It's true. And motivation is hard to come by at their jobs. One man was asked when he got to work every day. He says, usually about 30 minutes after I clock in. <laughs> but life goes on, so he, got, so he goes to work. So I call this message, Gotta Go to Work, because we do, right? And Solomon is covering work quite a bit in this passage. So verse 9, what profit has the worker from that in which he labors? Solomon asked this basic question in chapter 1, verse 3. Now in the preceding eight verses, uh, chapter uh, verses 2 through 8, so I guess, be, is that 8? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, sorry. Verses, <laughs> math, not even once. Solomon presented 14 constructive activities with 14 destructive act alternatives. In other words, they basically all cancel each other out. So Solomon asked the question again, what profit has the worker from that in which he labors? What can we possibly get out of life? if everything cancels out? Well, from a worldly perspective, which is what Solomon's doing, the answer is nothing. <laughs> you don't get anything out of this. If, it's, if everything that's good gets canceled out by an equal thing, but it's bad, there's no point. But for the Christian, it's not the same. If this isn't our home, we aren't as concerned with here as we are with there heaven. That's what our future and our hope is. We still live here. We have to be, in fact, I hate that saying when people say, oh, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. I think that's wrong because I think the more heavenly minded you are, the better earthly good you'll be because you'll be a better citizen. You'll live more for Jesus. You'll focus more on him. You'll be more obedient to him. He's actually your boss. So when you go to work, you're working for Jesus. Now think about that. Would you clock in and go to work 30 minutes after you clocked in? Or would you be, sir, yes, sir, <laughs> the punch. And he's also your boss before you punch the card. It's just all the time, however you act, because he's in charge. So what does he say? Verse 10, I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. It's work. Do you know who invented work? It wasn't your mom. 
It wasn't your boss or your dad. It was God who invented work. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, going into detail about the creation of man and woman. He says, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to kick back and lay in a hammock. No, to tend and keep it. That's what it says. Tend and keep means labor, work, do work, till the ground to have charge of it. So God gave Adam work to do. See, Adam wasn't a freeloader. God didn't set up the Garden of Eden, put it in motion, set you there and just whatever. I'll get you an Xbox. You'll like it. You know, <laughs> no, that's not it. Work was not only created by God. God expects us to do it. In first, uh, Second Thessalonians, rather, chapter 3, verse 10, says, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. That's pretty harsh sounding, isn't it? Now, this isn't talking about those who can't work for any reason, or whatever reason, or those who are temporarily out of work. That's not what this means. If you're disabled, a legitimate disability, well, yes, you can't work, so... You need to be taken care of. But there are a lot of people that are able to work. Well, I'm going to get to that in a second. This is speaking to those, as I was going to say, who refuse to work, which seems to be happening now for whatever reason, in spades. I've never seen so many help wanted signs in my life. So many businesses need people. And they're forced to go to limited hours because they don't have the employees. Or they finally go to, they shut down on certain days because they don't have the employees and they got to give people days off. Or they shut down completely because they just don't, they, I'm sorry, I'd love to serve you. I have a good product. You've obviously liked it. You've been here before. Well, we got to shut down because I'm not doing all the work all the time, seven days a week. It just can't happen. It seems like many people have adopted a form of the Hindi faith. And they're greeting, namaste. You know, when they, you tell them of a job they should apply for, and they say, namaste. And you say, no, 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 you need a job. Aren't you going to go try and get one? And they say, namaste on the couch. <laughs> Think it through. It'll get there. <laughs> but you see, work is there. And there's a reason for it. That was nam. must stay on the couch. You get it? OK, going on. So <laughs> some of you are like, <laughs> but there's a reason for work. Work is a God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. Occupied means clever enough to be occupied, to be busied with. God gave us something to do. That old saying that idle hands are the devil's playground, I think that's really true. If you just sit around long enough, you're going to get into trouble. Don't you th How many here are parents? How many people here have kids that if you leave them alone too long with nothing to do, trouble happens? How many times do you leave them alone with stuff to do and still trouble happens? Yeah, exactly. So God gives us work to do as part of that is to get things done, to accomplish things. Now, verse 11, he says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. And I love this. There's a song, an old chorus from Calvary Chapel days. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful in his time. Lord, my life to you I bring. May each song I have to sing be to you. A lovely, oh, I know the words. <laughs> They're not coming out. Be to you a lovely thing in your time. And it's just great. But that's not what he's talking about, okay? This isn't talking about nature, rather. Even though natural, uh, natural, wow, natural things fit into it. You can take a caterpillar, and what does it do? We even have a great word for it, metamorphosis. It changes, and it becomes a beautiful butterfly. And that's great, but what this is talking about is everything has an appropriate time. And when those things happen in their time, it's a beautiful thing. And of course, their beautiful time is God's time. Because I remember talking with a woman, and she said, she was sobbing, and she said, I want to get married so badly. I really want to get married. i got to find a man and get married. And I said, well, you can do one of two things. You can find Mr. Right, or you can marry Mr. Right now. <laughs> and she's like, she stopped crying. She's like, well, I don't want that necessarily. I mean, it might be Mr. Right. And she gave up looking. Within six months, she'd met a guy and was engaged. I mean, it was, and they got married, and it was great. So it works. You know, but not that I'm the great marriage counselor. I'm just saying, hey, there's a certain thing 
it's called the timing that God has, and if we go along with it, it's just better, and everything works better. Okay, so he says, also he has put eternity in their hearts. Do you know that every person has a sense of eternity? Even those in the deepest jungles of darkest Africa, or even, you don't have to go so far, your own family members, they have a sense of eternity. If nothing else, just bring them to church when they don't want to go. It'll seem like eternity to them until the service is over. But only Christians have the correct sense of eternity. Not because we're special, not because we're better than any other person, any non-believing, non-Christian as we call them, or pre-Christians as I like to call them, but because we read the Bible. And the Bible has the answers because the Bible was ultimately written by God to us. So if you give a biblical answer to somebody, you don't have to quote the verse. I mean, you can, but you don't have to. You can just give them the biblical principle. And it surprises me how many times people say, hey, that's a good answer. That's pretty smart. I'm like, well, I read it in a book somewhere. <laughs> but that doesn't mean we'll understand people and, and that whole idea, the eternity in their hearts, because it says, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to end. We also can't understand the things that God does. How many concepts about God are there that we don't understand, um, that we can't grasp with our finite brains? Well, it's, it's right funny. Right here in my notes, it says, I'll tell you, it's a lot. <laughs> yes, there's so much about God we don't know. How about a few examples? How about this one? The triune nature of God. The Bible teaches, you won't, I don't find the word Trinity in the Bible. You won't, but the triune nature of God is taught. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but Isaiah very clearly states there's only one God. So either the Bible's really confusing, or God is made up of three persons in one God. Now just, just that, try to grasp that, and completely, purely, absolutely, completely understand it. And you're like, I, I'm going to stay on the couch. I don't think I can figure that one out. I can't, but it's written in here, so I accept it. Do you understand the difference? It's truth. Just because I, as a creation, can't understand God, this great creator, doesn't make him ununderstandable enough to where I can appreciate him and love him. doesn't make him any different just because I don't get it. You know, football teams have tremendously complex plays. I don't understand a lot of what's going on. I've been watching it since I was in high school. And yet I appreciate it. And I can say, wow, you guys do all that and I'll just watch. <laughs> you know, I don't understand the football mind, the science mind, the even pol politics. I mean, there's a lot to it that you don't understand. I think every person who goes in as president when they're brand new thinks they know what they're going to be doing. And with the time they're halfway through, they're like, what am I doing? Why am I here? <laughs> they're so, you just look at how they age over even four years. I mean, it's amazing. So often, they come out looking so much older. It's such a weight. You don't understand it. But God, the triune nature of God, and here's another one. How about this? God has always existed. I mean, I can understand always existing from here on, but always existing in the past? I don't get that. But the Bible clearly teaches it. He spoke everything into existence. He just said so. Let there be light. There was light. Let the dry land appear. There was land. Let the trees appear. Appear? So I can't even say it. But good thing he didn't say appear. <laughs> he said appear. <laughs> and the trees grew. What kind of power is that? I don't get that. I don't have that kind of power. It's amazing. The Bible. How about this? It has lasted for thousands of years. And sometimes it's been in the clutches of people who would unscrupulously change it, yet it hasn't changed. God hasn't allowed it. Somehow it's made it through. How about the people that reject the free offer of eternal life? I don't get that either. I really don't. How about the fact that our bodies will die, but our souls will never die? I'm still not even totally wrapping my brain around that. That everything works together for good for those who love the Lord. When you're in the middle of something and you think, I don't know how this can possibly work out, and then it does, you go, there you go again, God. <laughs> These are things that are hard for us to grasp. But verse 12, he says, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. We have to understand where Solomon's coming from in his relationship with the Lord. He started out great. 
He's a young, very young man, and he became king when David died. And God says, in a vision, he says, dream, what do you want me to give to you? And he says, um, wow. I'll tell you what, God. I'm king, and I have no idea how to be king. I need wisdom. I need, I need to be smart, and I know I'm not. <laughs> so please give me that. God says, hey, not only is that a good answer, but I'm going to extend it, and you will also get riches, and you will also get all these extra benefits But because you wanted wisdom. So he had this great relationship with God, and he was known for how smart he was in making godly decisions. But by constant and consistent, over the years, disobedience, such as marrying many wives, where the Bible, God clearly forbid that, forbade, I guess, in the past tense, he drifted farther and farther from the Lord. The reason he had drifted farther from the Lord with his many wives, they lured him away from the only true God and encouraged him to worship gods that don't exist. And he wasted time worshiping them, building them idols, building the, the temples for them. And when you do that, you wander from the truth. And, and it isn't so much that the false gods don't exist, even though they don't, but it's much more that the one who is behind them, the devil, actually hates you, and he hates God. And because you love God, he wants to damage you to try to get back at God and to keep you from having that relationship with him. Now, rejoicing and doing good are fine things to do. That's fine. As long as you rejoice in the Lord and you do good things as an act of obedience to him, then you're fine. That's what Solomon should have been talking about. So, verse 13, And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy all the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. Now, on the surface, it can sound pretty good. I like to eat. I like to drink. I like to say, hey, I'm enjoying the fruits of my labor. Look what I've done, and now I get to enjoy it. And God gave it to me, by the way. But you see, Solomon was what the Bible calls a backslidden believer. He was kind of like he was this way, and he kind of slid back in his life away from God. And all he had to really draw on was his earthly experiences. That's all he had left. When you don't have a godly perspective, there's only one other perspective to have, an earthly perspective. And he tacked it is the gift of God on the end, I guess, to sound more spiritual. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I tried to figure that out. But there's nothing wrong with eating and drinking and working hard and enjoying the rewards. Just this morning, Chris always brings up these farm stories. We put in a, we got a shed and we, I put a wall in it. The back one third or so is the chicken coop. The front two thirds are her she shed. She can do whatever she wants with it. But the dogs kept getting into, and they were right by the gate. We're trying to feed the chickens, and the dogs, we have one that just wants to chase them, one that's just kind of, hey, what are those? One wants to kill them and eat them. And so that's bad, you know. So then I put a fence along here, so it goes over to the, uh, the shop, and the other side goes to the garden fence, so the dogs cannot get there. It was really nice today. I just opened the gate, got in, closed the gate. I knew the dogs wouldn't get there. That's enjoying the fruits of your labor. That's the type of thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, getting something accomplished and enjoying it, that's fine. But we can't allow that to be the only thanks we give. You see, we must include, not only rather, include God in our thanks. He has to be the first one we thank. He has to be the one we thank that points out that we need to get that done. He has to be the one we thank that provides the resources to get it done. And he has to be the one to thank. You can say, hey, God, you gave me the ability and it's finished. Thank you. See what I'm saying? It's the whole process. That's what we need to do. So, okay, verse 14. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. And I put it here, as they say about even a blind squirrel will find a nut once in a while. <laughs> even a backsliding Christian can sometimes find the truth in their mixed up brains. Solomon has done, I think, exactly that here. God is only interested in eternal things. Doesn't mean he doesn't get involved in our lives and bless us beyond what we deserve and protect us from things, but it's all because eventually we're going to be with him in eternity. We can't add to them and we can't take away from those things. By accepting Jesus Christ into our lives as the Lord and Savior that he already is, he's already our Lord and Savior, we might as well just get with the program. That's what I like to say. We can make sure that we are heaven bound, that we will be with God for eternity. 
We don't even accomplish our own salvation. God did it all. I remember singing that song. Um, I think Keith Green did a version of it. Created me a pure heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Is what I used to sing for years. It's, the, it's thy salvation. Salvation isn't even our idea. <laughs> We're so lame we have to have salvation provided for us because we wouldn't find it on our own. It's true. It's a, it's a sad truth. But hey, how about this? He knows all that and still loves us and still provided it. That's a good deal. So our part is to simply accept him into our lives, and then we experience him in a whole new way. And it's permanent. How many things in life are permanent? You grow up. You lose your baby teeth. You get what kind of teeth are they called? Permanent teeth. But do they ever get holes in them, have to be pulled out, fall out on their own, whatever? What do women get their hair done? It's called, I got a permanent. No, I used to tell you got a temporary. It won't last very long, and you have to go back in again, and then it'll grow out, and you have to cut it and, and cut it and cut it and color it. and Yeah, sure. But it's, it's, there aren't many things in life that are permanent, but if you trusted Jesus as Savior and Lord, if you allow him to be the Savior and Lord that he already is, that's permanent. Guaranteed. Okay, God does it that men should fear him. This is kind of a verse that can kind of scare people. It's exactly because of this, because of the fact that God does it. God does so much more than we even know of. It makes him easy to serve and love. When I was plumbing, I was asked by several people, you know, you got a lot of customers that love you. I mean, I went to different companies, and they would find me. They'd call the, the company and say, no, he doesn't work here. Where does he work? He doesn't work here. Where does he work? He doesn't work here. So they would just hang up. They'd call around different shops, or they'd call my house. Where does he work? Because I need him to come out. That was very, very satisfying and very uh, complimentary and humbling. Yet at the same time, they'd say, why don't you start your own business? And I'm like, look, what I have seen that the boss does, I don't want to do. And I know he does so much more that I'll never know about. I don't want to do all that. It's just me. So I want to work for someone else and be able to go home, <laughs> shut it off, done. You know, <laughs> do something else. Except for the times when I was on call. Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, <laughs> New Year's. Fourth of July, Labor Day, Memorial Day, worked them all. Not everyone, all the time, but had to go out on all of them. They pulled a funny one on me on Thanksgiving one time. We went over to a friend's house, and I was on call, and the pager went off. Back, remember pagers? They weren't, <laughs> they weren't permanent. Good point. But they were a boat anchor, though. Man, that was heavy on your hip. So I got a, I got a page, and there was a number, and what they'd give me so I called the office, and they said, yeah, they called. They have a plug drain, so they need you to call them. So here's the number. So I dialed the number from the friend's house, because I didn't just before cell phones. And it was a busy signal. And I thought, you know, I hate this. When people want, to, want you to come, but they're calling every shop in town, because it's Thanksgiving Day. So everybody's busy. And every time I called, the phone was busy. And I got madder and madder. And finally, Chris Kimmer said, honey, we did that. We gave him this number that you're dialing from. So, of course, it's busy every time. <laughs> and though I was relieved, there was a part of me that wasn't. <laughs> and then I had to laugh. You know, like six years later, I thought it was funny. But, <laughs> but it really got to me. Wow. Wow. That was just so funny. But anyway, God does so much more. That whole thing because of the boss, right? The, tangent. But God does so much more than we'll even know of. It makes him easier to serve him and love him. Explain this to me, if you can, speaking of things that, about God that we can't understand. How can God know every thought of every person on the planet simultaneously and simultaneously knowing when every flower will bloom, every pig will squeal, <laughs> every bird will fly, and every star will shine? And you could add to the list infinite number of things. All of that and so much more. But wait, there's more, right? At the same time, all the time, that is a great reason to fear before him. I covered this last time we were talking in Ecclesiastes. This fear of the Lord is not a cowering, begging fear. It is the proper reverence that the creature owes to the creator and the redeemed owes to the redeemer. It is a proper respect and honoring of God. 
It's that type of fear. You know, I, I was pretty good friends with my plumbing boss when I first started, but there was a part of me that, that feared him, not to be afraid, but I respected him. Because he told me when he hired me, he says, you know, one day I'm going to be able to hand you a list, a stack rather, of invoices. And you're just going to be able to go out there and take care of all the jobs without ever calling me. And that was just overwhelming. I almost fell over backwards like, no way. And it wasn't long before I was handed a stack of invoices, went out and didn't have to call for help. It just happened. But I, then I had even more respect for him. How did you know that? <laughs> well, you have an aptitude for mechanical stuff, and I saw it, so I trained you right. So you could do it. It's not that hard. So this fear of the Lord is not a scary thing. And then he says in 15, that which is has already been, and what is to be has already been. But what this really means is God is in control. We have a saying for this. History repeats itself. <laughs> Why does it do that? I give you two reasons. Number one, God is in control, as we see here. And number two, human nature is the same throughout history. I firmly believe that if you took a newborn baby, if you could get in a DeLorean and put in your 1.21 gigawatts and go back in time 600 years, fly, fly. I'm going to move this. I'm going to hit this mic. I know. Sorry, John. Hope it doesn't affect the sound. I'm just keep bumping it. <laughs> it's okay. Just, can you hear me now? Anyway, so if you could take it back and gra grab someone's baby, maybe the parents too, because they probably wouldn't want to be separated, but bring it to this time and raise it, it would not know the difference, have no idea it would be fine, because human nature is the same. All you got to do is read the Bible, the Old Testament, and you say, how could they have done that? And you realize, oh, how could I have done that? <laughs> Similar type of thing, faced with that same problem. That's why it's easy to see how history would repeat itself, because people are involved. <laughs> okay? It's true. And God requires an account of what is past. Again, he's looking into his mind, Solomon is, for Christian principles. Now, God will require an account for what we have done, which makes you want to do better, right? Kind of gives you the old Curly from the Three Stooges reaction to that. <laughs> like, whoa. But take comfort in this. If you've accepted Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, and you have, then you have no punishment coming to you for your sins. No punishment at all, because God already punished Jesus on the cross in your place. And Jesus went there with joy in his heart, because he knew what it would accomplish. The fact that your sins would be paid for. Incredible. Incredible. That's another thing put into the file of, I don't understand that about God. Because I love you all, but I don't think I'd do that for you. And go through that for you? It's ungrateful, lazy, sinful people? What? But Jesus says, no. When he got up to heaven, they say, how did it go? And he goes, oh, they're to die for. So um, <laughs> now Solomon goes back to his earthly way of looking at things. Verse 16. Moreover, I saw under the sun. Remember, Solomon is looking at things here as under the sun. In other words, the earthly plane, not heavens. As in the sun, the center of our solar system, the S-U-N, not under the S-O-N as in the Lord of our lives. So it's a very earthly way of looking at things. But Omar saw under the sun, in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. Anybody see that today? The place of judgment? How about our judicial system? You ever see wickedness in the place where judgment should be? Yes, good, pure judgment should be there. Wickedness is there instead. And in the place of righteousness. Iniquity. Iniquity. That word is a tough one today. And in the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. There should be righteousness. And instead, there's sin. And this is a very cynical, although accurate, way of looking at the way of the world. Where do we see where righteousness should be and iniquity abounds instead? Not all the time. We see it in the church. And that's a black eye on us. And if any of you have seen iniquity where righteousness should be in the church, remember this. It wasn't God. It was not God who was unrighteous. It was not God who committed iniquity. Now, why would people be in a church and commit sins? Well, let me see. They're human beings. <laughs> it's not an excuse, but it's a fact. Okay? That's why you don't put your stock in Calvary Chapel Cuna or Pastor Chris or even Mrs. Chris or the structure 
or any other church or any other thing put together by people, stop it, fly. <laughs> you put your faith, your hope, and what you hang on to is Jesus. Amen. And him crucified, risen, ascended, and promising to come back. That's what you hang on to. That'll never fail. That'll never crumble. Okay. I don't want that kind of pressure put on me anyway. <laughs> Although I need it to keep from sinning. But So Solomon turned to his heart. He says in verse 17, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Now this is true for two reasons. Number one, there is righteousness in everyone's heart. By that I mean there is, everyone has a sense of what's right and what's wrong. It's just we do. It's just that some of us suppress it. As James said, some of people have their conscience seared as with a hot iron. It's like you take a, you know what a soldering iron is? That with that metal thing that sticks out and you touch it to solder and the solder melts and you can put things together with it. Take that and put it on your conscience. Just burn it, burn it, burn it. Say, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. And eventually you don't care. You don't. That's how people can become the awful, unscrupulous people they are and not care in the least because the only thing they care about is what their inner circle of friends. They can kill 17 people in the process of doing something, but if you hurt one of their friends, you're the worst person on earth. It's like, I don't understand that kind of thinking. There's righteousness, though, that's in everyone's heart. And verse number two, rather, along with that sense of right and wrong comes a desire to see the truth come out and the wicked punished, right? As long as we're not the one who is wicked. We don't want us punished. But everyone else, oh yeah, they're going down. Now, fortunately, as Solomon said, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. Now, speaking of God, Romans, 6, 6, Romans 2, 6 through 11 says, Who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. They get eternal life. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, Indignation and wrath is their future. Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and of the Gentile, or the Greek, he says. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. I love that. By that he means he doesn't put any person above anyone else. Everyone's on the same level playing field. You either sin or you don't. You either obey God or you sinned but it doesn't matter as far as you're the president, you're the vice president, you're the trash man, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're a star athlete, you're a movie star, you're just a guy who goes to work, you don't think I'm belittling this, but you're just a housewife, you know what I mean? What, there, there is no looking down upon people. God puts everyone on the same level. The wicked get judged with punishment, the righteous do get judged, but we get rewards. That's pretty cool. Do you like rewards? Like you go to Fred Meyer and you get your Fred Meyer rewards. You go to Albertsons and you get your Albertsons rewards and you go to the gas pump. But every rewards thing takes 10 cents off a gallon. It's a pretty good deal when the prices are this high. I love when I have, don't realize I have like seven or eight of those. Nice. <laughs> it's almost back to where it was in January. Okay, so um, verse 18 again, I said in my heart. Now in this case, this is a mistake by Solomon. He got away with it in the last verse, but in this verse, he's wrong to trust his heart. Why? Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above how many things? All things. And there's more, desperately wicked. Who can know it? And that's a rhetorical question, by the way, because we can't. <laughs> you ever done something? You say, why did I do that? Why, 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 why? I could have held back. I could have not said that. I could have not done that. I could have done something good instead of that. Instead, why did I do that? Paul said that, this wretched man that I am, why do I keep sinning? The things I should do, I don't do. The things I don't, I shouldn't do, I do. That's what I call the doo-doo section in Romans 7. What is wrong? What is the one thing that you take with you everywhere you go? Your heart and it's desperately wicked, and it's deceitful above all things. You can't know it. Now, according to Napoleon Dynamite, it's okay. Just trust your heart. That's what I do. I love that movie, but that line is just so lame. But then again, he's not actually the coolest guy on the planet, right? <laughs> the smartest guy. But anyway, saying anything in your heart is risky business. If I may paraphrase the great sage Obi-Wan Kenobi, 
from the first Star Wars movie in 1977 when he's training Luke and he puts the blast shield. But I'm going to change the words. He says, your heart can deceive you. Don't trust it. <laughs> it really can, okay? And here's what he said. Now, we, we're given a heart and we're given emotions. And yes, it's okay to have them. When I was choking up with the words about that chorus for the Lord, I, that doesn't bother me because choruses about God and songs about the Lord get to me. Some Hallmark movies get to me. I'm just a sap. But anyway, so. <laughs> but it's okay to have emotions, and God wants us to mix them in. But just don't always go by them. That's the problem. Okay, here's what he said in his heart. Concerning the condition of the sons of men, God tests them that they may see that they themselves are like animals. In one respect, this is true. And that one respect is in the very next verse. Verse 19, for what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them. As one dies, so does the other. Sure, they have all one breath. Man has no advantage over animals, for all is vanity. Solomon's basically saying this. Animals die, people die. It's the same thing for both of them. <laughs> That's what he's saying. In looking at this the way Solomon did and the way a lot of people do, there's no advantage in being a human. In fact, now, if you protect animals above people, you're a hero in, in the world, right? You know who Greta is, right? How dare you? <laughs> that teenager from wherever it is, somewhere in Europe. She's just misled, and she's the climate change expert, and yet the people that go to great schools and get great degrees and have great understanding are disagreeing with her, but they're the idiots. And I'm not blaming her. They put her up to that. I mean, she's misled, but you see what I'm saying? <laughs> but the way people go to it, they think it's, the old saying is, be a hero, save a whale, but save a baby and go to jail. It's just wrong, <laughs> you know? They just get it out of balance. There are people who quote this verse, though, and think there's no advantage of being human. They say, look, even the Bible says people are no different from animals. But just because it's written in the Bible doesn't mean it's right. There are a lot of things written in the Bible for contrast to show how wrong that kind of thinking is. And this is one of those things. What did Jesus say? Let's go back to him. Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Of course we are. Jesus Christ, the second person of the triune God, came in human form in the flesh to earth to die in your place so you could go to heaven and be with him for eternity if all you do is believe in him. Remember my friend Matt, what he says? Pretty good deal. <laughs> it really is. And then he says, surely they all have one breath. Now that's true. Animals breathe in and exhale, right? My dog does, and boy, when it eats something, whew, <laughs> you can tell, right? But what Solomon is saying here is that animals and man both have the same kind of life in them. He sees no difference. But in, ex in Genesis, rather, chapter 1 and 2, we see that animals were created by God when he spoke them into existence. But man was made from something that already existed, the dust of the earth. And then God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. That's in Genesis 2-7. And then Genesis 1-27, where it gives an overview of creation. He says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God created them different from the animals. No, image, no animal gets this distinction of being created in the image of God. And by that, it means basically to know and have a conscience, to know right and wrong, to know righteousness, to know evil, all these things. God created us with that capacity. Animals, the only thing they have is fear of retribution. Because no matter how many times, we have a yellow lab named Maui, no matter how many times he gets in trouble for getting into food that he's not supposed to eat, he will continue to eat it. And you can leave the room for five minutes and... I had a sandwich, and Maui's like, thanks. You know, it's like, gosh, Maui, that dog. Got to have my daughter watch this one. Because it's her dog. We love that guy. He's the sweetest dog, as Melissa says, but he's very naughty. And he is. But people can be taught not to do things, and they can actually enjoy obeying. It's weird. 
animals don't really have that. Animals just do it out of fear of retribution. And if you're not around, they'll probably go back to that behavior. It's just what happens. Most of the time I see that. So Solomon's conclusion, man has no advantage over animals for all is vanity. See, any reasonable look at scripture will say, no, that's not true. Solomon is look under the S-U-N finds no hope for any of us. Once again, he says, all is vanity. Vanity, again, means emptiness, futility, vapor, that which vanishes quickly and leaves nothing behind. Just think about that in the wintertime when it's cold outside and you go, and you see that big breath, and then it's gone. That's what he's saying. Life is just is vain. There's nothing to it. Verse 20. Oh, excuse me. I want to interject this. Jesus didn't look at us as a vain thing when he went to the cross. So you've got to remember these balanced things. In verse 20, all go to one place, all are from the dust, and all return to dust. Physically, this is true. Our bodies are born, we live, we die, we're buried, cremated, whatever happens, we go back to the earth. Animals are born, live, die, and eventually are buried or they go back to the earth. But it says, all return to dust. All go to one place. I'm not sure that that's true, actually. I've never seen in the Bible where it says that animals go to heaven. I think animals are sent from heaven a lot of times. They're just so sweet. And so I think dogs, I'm a big dog guy. I think dogs are a great example of the unconditional love of, of God. So often we can be just so angry with them. Sometimes for good reasons. Sometimes because we're mad and we take it out on the dog, whatever. And we ask them, oh, come here, I'm sorry. And they go, oh, they're so excited to come back to you. You know, they just, they condition. And then there are ones that they know to stay away from, right? People that are mean to them too much, I hope, forget you. But in general, if you're loving toward them, they'll be so loyal. You could be a serial killer, go out and do horrendous things, but be good to your dog, the dog's going to like you, doesn't know the difference. That's another reason why they're different than we are. They can watch you to hurt somebody and just go, well, at least you're not hurting me, you know, <laughs> whatever. So verse 21, who knows the spirit of the sons of men, which go upward, and the spirit of animal, which goes down to the earth? Here's the spiritual side he's looking at. And Solomon, I think, is missing it big time. The New Living Translation, I think, gives us a better understanding of what Solomon meant. It says, for who can prove that the human spirit goes up and the spirit of animals goes down to the earth? I say, um, scripture <laughs> can prove that. He didn't have it at that time, but we have the benefit of Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's talking about the actual second coming of Christ when he comes down to earth, riding the white horse, king of kings and lord of lords on his thigh. It's going to be so awesome. And it says that there'll be all the saints riding white horses behind him. We can't come with him unless we're already there to begin with, right? Am I wrong? Thank you. <laughs> Rick and Michelle are here today, but they didn't come with us. They joined us. They are with us now, but they came on their own. It's a difference. We can't get to heaven on our own. We get to heaven because of Jesus, but when we get there, when he comes back, we're coming with him. That's proof that we're going to go there. Now, where do the horses come from? I don't know. Maybe there's some of the ones from the Old West. I don't know. <laughs> but the point is, maybe they're specially constructed up there in a stable just waiting for the right number of people to get saved, and then we get to all go up to that big corral. I don't even know if we'll need spurs because I think they'll do what they're supposed to. But you know what I'm saying? It's, ex it's exciting, but we're going to be there. It's proven in Scripture. And that's just one verse going on. Solomon's conclusion in verse 22. So I perceive that nothing is better then that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his heritage. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? So Solomon, I think, came to a sad conclusion in his under the sun thinking. He reasoned that man should rejoice in his works and leave a heritage behind, and that's all you got. And that is backsliding, really. It really is. And then he says, who can bring him to see what will happen after him? How about God? The Bible, we have proof that we will see things. Jesus himself said that he talks about he's the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob and Isaac. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. As soon as we, because he was talking to the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection, so that's sad, you see. That's how you know who they are. They don't believe in that. And so they tried to trick him, and he's like, stop. 
He's the God of the living. He's not the God of the dead. So even after you die here, you're instantly in heaven with the Lord, and therefore you will always be with him. Again, pretty good deal, don't you think? But I can say that the Bible teaches so much more than that, so that is a sad way of thinking it. As I said in earlier in my teaching about Ecclesiastes, Solomon looked under the sun. We have to, as Christians, have to live and look under the Son of God, and that's Jesus. So we do have to go to work. we got to go to work, as the saying is. But hopefully we can do it with a, a better perspective than to think it's just for a check. It's just to survive. But we can radiate and show the love of Jesus everywhere we go. Even if you get hit with COVID-19 or a, a cancer, you know what, what cancer is an invitation to? Places that you couldn't go if you weren't a cancer patient. And you can tell them about Jesus. You can shine for the Lord wherever you are. When you need to buy a car, you can radiate Jesus to the car salesman. You don't have to stand on a Bible and shout at him. You can just be someone who's reasonable to work with, and they're like, wow, that guy was different in a good way. Wow, wow exactly. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for Solomon. <clears throat> thank you for his wanderings, because, man, we wander, we stray, we, like sheep, if we don't have that shepherd, if we don't constantly look to you and be reminded of your love for us and your care, we can go any number of places. But we do thank you that we don't have to worry about that if we stay in you. And if we don't, you still lovingly will leave the 99 and come after the one, which would be us. <sighs> your greatness and your love is beyond our capacity to understand. But we get a glimpse of it, which is better and more love than we get from anybody else on the planet, which hopefully will keep us in a great relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, and pray for your protection on us till we get together again in Jesus' name. Amen.